Mystery of the Black Obelisk. Do you know what this is? Uh -huh. I know you think you do. Keep watching and in five minutes you'll know exactly what it is and more important, why it matters. It was way back in 1846. Sir Austin Henry Layard was digging at the ancient site of Nimrod in northern Iraq when he uncovered a four-sided black limestone obelisk six and a half feet tall. On each of the four sides are five bas-relief sculptures of subjugated kings. Captions above and below the reliefs describe the tribute as well as the Assyrian king receiving the tribute, namely Shalmaneser III. The name Shalmaneser is also mentioned in 2 Kings 17.3. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his servant and brought him tribute. But this was likely Shalmaneser V. The king of Israel at the time of Shalmaneser III was Jehu. So is King Jehu on the black obelisk? If he is, then this would be the very first pictorial representation of a king of Israel anywhere in the world. But why? There are countless statues, friezes, and murals of neighboring kings in Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. Why not Israel's kings? What about David and Solomon? Why don't we have even one statue of them? For a very good reason. It was against God's laws. The second commandment states, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The kings of Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria made statues of themselves because they were worshipped as gods. And God didn't want Israel to do that. Even Herod the Great, as evil as he was, didn't put his face on coins, although some of his descendants eventually would. But what about the black obelisk? Would Assyrians carve the face of King Jehu onto their stone memorial? The idea never occurred to Sir Austin Henry ah. Layard or to the other scholars who studied the stone, including Sir Henry Rawlinson, who stated, ah. the second line of offerings are said to have been sent by Yahua, son of Hubiri, a prince of whom there is no mention in the annals, and of whose native country, therefore, I am ignorant. It wasn't until a year later that Reverend Edward Hinks wrote in his diary thought of an identification of one of the obelisk captives with Jehu, king of Israel, and satisfying myself on the point, wrote a letter to the Athenium announcing it. Reverend Hinks had a very good case for Jehu, which still stands today. The image depicted is dressed in traditional Israelite clothing for the time period, not Assyrian. The caption does not match any of the other surrounding nations, the closest contender to Jehu being Joram, or Jehoram, king of Judah. And finally, by comparing the biblical timeline and Assyrian records, Jehu was in fact the king of Israel at the time of King Shalmaneser III. So who was this King Jehu? And why was he carved onto the black obelisk? The books of the Kings and Chronicles record how Jehu was anointed by Samuel to bring judgment on King Ahab and his descendants. However, after wiping out the royal family and becoming king himself, <laughs> Jehu stopped following God altogether. <laughs> 2 Kings 10.31 but Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. The story of Jehu in the Bible basically ends there. However, it seems quite probable that God chose to humble Jehu for his idolatry through an Assyrian king. And if you go to the British Museum today, you can still see the prostrate form of King Jehu as he bows before the great Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III. Above the base relief sculpture is the caption, I received the tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase with pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and spears. The black obelisk is an amazing testament to the historical accuracy of the Bible, and that's why it matters. So what is it? Huh? The black obelisk. But then, you already knew that. <laughs>